We will call the 23rd meeting of the Common Council to order. <coughs> Pat, would you call the roll? Bauman? Here. Berg? Here. Bonnet? Here. Doyle? Here. Graf? Here. Manny? Here. Montemayor? Here. Moody? Here. Perez? Here. Rinfleisch? Here. Stephan? Here. Van Akron? Here. Vanderweel? Here. Wangaman? Here. Warner? Here. Winninger? Here. 16 present. Forms present. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. I would move that we approve the minutes of the last Common Council meeting in the same standard approved as entered on the record. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the minutes of the previous Council meeting. Under discussion. <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Alderman Bonet, would you lead us in a pledge tonight? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have one hearing tonight, and that's to propose 2004 annual action plan for the Federal Community Block Grant Funds for project year April 1st, 2004 to March 31st, 2005. Now, any interested parties wishing to be heard, please step up to the microphone in the back. Uh, if you could make it as brief as possible, we have a lot of people here and I'm sure everybody wants to be heard, so if you want to be heard, please step up to the microphone at this time. Name and address, home address. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and member of common councils. Uh, my name is uh, Cha Song Yang. I'm the director of the Hmong Associations. Could you spell your first name, please? C H A S O N G. C H. C H A S O N G. But most of people know me by song. That's what I thought. I'll, sure right then. <laughs> I'll, I'll put song. The longer you live in the United States, your name getting bigger. <laughs> so. I'm here to speak um, not against the uh, bus services. I think bus services are good, are very important to the people in Sheboygan. But I just have concern how the decision has been made, uh, the recommendation decision has been made by the finance committee. I feel that the decision was uh, not fair and shortcut the uh, uh, process. I feel that if the city is going to continue to open uh, the city block grant for the community, I think this should be a formal process established that, it will, main, that will maintain the fairness and equal opportunity for everyone. Uh, if you, the city have asked a group of citizens that spend hours of the time to review the proposal and listen to a presentation for all the agencies before they make the recommendation to the best they can. And for the uh, finance committee to shortcut that process, I think it's, it's unfair and inappropriate. In our case, for the Hmong Association, I understand the finance committee has recommended reduce our grant from $19,500 to $1,000. For all the work we plan to do, member of common council found $1,000 doesn't do us any good. I would rather have that spend on family literacy or support medical uh, emergency for the Mental Health Association than uh, wasting $1,000 for our program because our proposal are asking for $30,000 and this uh, citizen advisory committee only cut it down to 19500 which we accepted because we went through the fair process. But for the finance community to short, shortcut the process, I think is, is not appropriate. And we'll ask that the Common Council uh, reject this finance committee recommendation and uh, you know, take back the recommendation of the Advisory Committee because they are the group that spend the time to listen to our proposal and our, our presentation. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Uh, 
My name is Ed Wachowski, and I'm a citizen of Sheboygan. What is your I, ad I, address, please? W-A-C-K-O-W-S-K-I. No, your address. Right, Edward, right. You want me to spell that your one? Your address. Oh, 2632 North 8th Street. Thank you. Okay. Tonight, we're here to discuss the federal block grant money and how it will be awarded to meet the goals and objectives of that grant as established by the federal government. It should be noted that these monies are not city or state dollars, but are federal tax dollars, and they are for a one-year period, one period only. Many applications have been received with a total request for funding exceeding $500,000, far more than available of monies of the block grant. All applicants who the Finance Committee has recommended for grants to be awarded do meet the qualifications established by the federal block grant. Uh, one of the applicants is the Sheboygan Transit Authority, and they do qualify for money. For this reason, they have the same right as all other applicants to receive block grant funds. Needless to say, some requests cannot be honored because there is simply not enough money. We are not here to discuss budget of the applicants or their funding sources or to offer advice to these applicants on how they can fund their agencies. We are here to explore how grant monies will be used and what programs and services will be provided by these funds. We should also consider how we get the biggest bang for the buck and how to have the most positive effect on the, on the most citizens of Sheboygan. You, the Common Council, have to make a tough decision this evening, and not everybody will be happy by the decisions you will make. I hope that one of the decisions will be to approve the Finance Committee's recommendation of funds for the transit system. Why? Because it is one of the applications that affects thousands of people, 52 weeks a year, and provides a service that is vital to these people. It also allows these monies to have a multiplying effect and produces even more matching federal dollars for our community. The need for night and Saturday bus service is not a luxury to people that need this service. It is a necessity because they have no other means of transportation. People who work during the day must shop for food, pay bills, get medical care, and etc., and have no other means of transportation. Many of, many of these people who use the service are physically handicapped, blind, in motorized wheelchairs, and are senior citizens. If you ever ridden the bus and seen the size of some of the packages that they try to carry, and I don't mean luxury items, I mean basic items like you and I take for granted, food. Much, many times, the bus drivers have to, ha have to assist the people because of their age or their handicap in getting on and off the bus. The cost of bus service limits the numbers of trips they can make to secure the basic needs of life because simply they can't afford the cost of many trips a week. Night and Saturday service provides people, teens, others, the ability to go to and from work. Not everybody works nine to five Monday through Friday. Without bus service, these people would not be able to work. Recently, you have read in the newspaper that ridership was down and some would say, that proves that bus service is not necessary. Well, I say, let's get real. Service was cut on Sunday. I say that that is the main reason for the decline in ridership, because those people that use the service on Sunday no longer can do it. Decline is proof of the negative effect reduced service is having on the citizens of our community. Now that we have taken the ability of senior citizens in the sunset of our life to attend church, are we going to deny these same people the ability to travel on Saturday? I hope not. I could go on and on and give reasons and examples that justify the grant for the, for the Sheboygan Transit, but I will limit my comments so that other people will have an opportunity to speak. I want to thank you in advance for your positive vote for the award of granting funds to the Sheboygan Transit on behalf of all the people that ride the buses. Thank you. Ed, could you spell your last name again for Pat, please? What's that? Spell your last name again for Pat. W-A-C-K-O-W-S-K-I. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Good, 
Good evening. Shar Pakniak, Executive Director for the Literacy Council of Sheboygan. I'm not here to speak against any of the other applicants for this grant money, but rather just to give a little bit of an explanation of what the Literacy Council is going to do with that funding. That funding that the Literacy Council receives is an investment back into the city. That funding is for textbooks, resources, and training to help those students get their GEDs, to advance their education, to go on even as we tutor them into maybe LTC, the university, or to other schooling opportunities. This helps them to get better paying jobs and become even more productive citizens of the Sheboygan area. It's real important to look at that funding as an investment into the future of our community because those people are the future of our community. And so the funding that is received by the Literacy Council is an investment back into what the city is able to do. Thank you, and I do not envy you in making your decision this evening. Thank you, Chair. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone else? My name is Henry Capitello and I'm the Executive Director for Home Inc. And just to let you know, we are not receiving any Community Development Block Grant monies this year. We're not on the list here for any of these funds. The reason I, I well, I'm scheduled to speak on the public forum, but I'm speaking now because you have a process that you go through when you look at identifying the use of these funds. I know for, for a fact that the city must develop some kind of plan that's sent to HUD, which basically shows how you're going to spend these monies. What are the things that you're, the categories that you're going to be spending on? Um, I think w there's three main categories. One is economic development. The other one is housing. The other one is, I think, social services. And I think that by taking money that you now have scheduled or have authorized or even have envisioned using, under a certain category, which would be social services for the community, you now set a precedence. You know, this time you're looking at $42,000 that you need for the transit authority. And, and, and I'll tell you, I, I, would, I would be the first one to say, no, you, you shouldn't be cutting services for the transit because a lot of the clients that we have at our residence, the Superior Manor, use the bus system. But I think what happens is, if you make choices like this, and then you enter into other areas of funds that traditionally have been used for providing social services to the poor, the needy, what's gonna happen next year when you run into even a tighter budget? Are you now looking that maybe the 42,000 is not 42,000, but you're gonna be looking at a couple hundred thousand? Then what other organizations or what other services within the community that are targeted for the needy, the poor, are you now going to have to sacrifice and say, we don't need this? You know, the poor do not have as much of a voice in government as other entities do. And I think you, the, the reason you, you see people like executive directors from different organizations coming here and speaking is because on their behalf, on their advocacy, by you now looking at taking this step, you now make a precedence. Now are you going to be looking next year for this as a possibility of more revenue that you're gonna be using for the transit? And maybe not even be the transit, maybe it's something else within the city that you are looking that you need money for. I think that by doing this, you are going to be entering in an area that you're going to set a precedence and which may not be the best interest for the low income, the needy, of the individuals in the city of Sheboygan. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Hi, my name is Sarah Euler. Um, the only transportation I have right now is the transit. And I know other communities need the money, but the transit needs it the most so they can keep the ridership. Um, it would be bad if they cut the Saturday services because nobody could get to work. And 
from my point of view, I don't feel like paying five or six dollars for a taxi just to get back and from work. And I mean, the buses, they have new buses that take a lot of the road space, but they're comfortable and they have a lot of people on there during the day. Not so much at night, but that's the only way I can get home. I don't feel like walking home at night at 8 o'clock at night, five or six blocks home. And I just think it would be a good idea to keep the weeknights and the Saturday services for the senior citizens and the disabled and for people like me who can't afford cars. Sir, can you spell your last name? O Y L E R. And then what is your address? 312 Ontario. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Anyone else? Thank you, Mayor Sham. My name is Brandon Jensen. It's B R A N D O N. Jensen is J E N S E N. I uh, traveled up here from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Address is 734 North 26th Street. Thank you. I'm the legislative director for the Transit Union. Uh, Chief Steward Ed Procheck, one of your operators, had invited me to come up. And some of you may remember last September, I also made the trip up here at a public hearing on uh, mass transit when there were some you know, discussions of cutting service, cutting the, the night service and the Sundays. And, you know, unfortunately, as Ed and I met for dinner before we came here, you know, we were talking about the weather and how the majority of our passengers, that, that's a big factor in whether they make trips and whether they go out. So I'd like to take you back to that night in September for those of you that were in attendance to remember all the people that did come out that night. The room was packed. You know, we got there early to make sure that we got a chance to meet some of the participants and, you know, it was, st you know, standing room only. and. It, we heard testimony after testimony of the people that needed the service, that relied on the service. And a lot of elderly, a lot of handicapped, a lot of people that are going to and from school that can't afford cars or, or don't have the opportunity to, to drive, you know, like many of us, uh, like many of us do. Um, as I testified last fall at that hearing, and then also last week at the finance, you're not alone here in Sheboygan. We've gone through the same situation in Milwaukee County. And nobody likes to see this, where you're taking social services and the services that people rely on and pitting against transit or pitting against parks or pitting against other divisions. But the reality is this, is this is our reality. This is the budget that we're in. You know, a lot of it goes back to the state, you know, cuts in state funding, cuts in state, you know, in federal funding for mass transit and for other areas. But the point is you guys have to be the visionaries. You guys have to look at the future. Where is the money going to be best spent? And has been brought up, mass transit, every dollar that's spent on mass transit receives $4 in matching funds from the state and federal government. That's an investment. You know, as well-meaning as a lot of the nonprofit organizations are, the reality is transit is a, is a much bigger investment because of that return. For every dollar you put in, you're getting $4 matched to it. And the reality is also, if you don't have transit services, how are people going to get new and, to and from the nonprofit organizations? to and from job training centers, to and from schools, and to and from their jobs. You know, in this time where we're losing jobs by the millions, we can't afford to lose any more. We can't afford to cut service because we're just gonna lose more jobs and we're gonna lose more opportunities and the revenues are gonna drop even further. And then six months, Ed's gonna call me and say, you gotta come back up here because we're facing more cuts. Because now it's the weekday service. We eliminated Sunday, we eliminated Saturday, we eliminated weeknight. Now we're talking about the weekday service, which means basically we'll have no transit system in Sheboygan. So I ask you tonight is that you consider that, not for the jobs in the union, not for the jobs in the transit system, but for the people that we get to and from work, to and from school, and to and from all these good nonprofit organizations that are trying to help the community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to be heard? Your Honor, I'll move that the hearing be closed. Move to second that the hearing be closed. Under discussion. Who did the second? Under discussion. Under discussion. Go ahead. Who did the second? I didn't hear. Okay. Just Speaking. under discussion. I will pull this forward as soon as we get to a point in the agenda where it's proper. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Close all eyes. Close all eyes. We're still under discussion. Yeah. So hang on a minute. Uh, Brandon, I'm sure you're aware of this also, and so is... Uh, Chief Stewart uh, Project. 
uh, Senator Feingold and some of his colleagues are working at in Washington to get funding for smaller cities from 50,000 to 200,000 and he named Sheboygan as one for getting some of that funding for transit system. Obviously that's not going to happen tomorrow but hopefully something will be in place within a year. So that should help us out also and I have the document up here if you'd like to see it. So it's a good thing. Okay, if there's no other discussion, Pat, would, we don't need a roll. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion cured. Steve Mears appointments. <coughs> uh, the first one is today's date. Hereby submit the following appointment for your consideration. Eldon Bird uh, be considered for the Citizens Advisory Committee on Community Development to fill the unexpired term of Bruce Wolf, which expires April 30, 2006. Mr. Wolf moved out of the city and no longer meets the requirements to serve on the committee. Signed by the mayor. And that will lay over. And uh, two documents that came in at the last meeting. Uh, Richard Lindy to be considered for the Board of Appeals to fill the unexpired term of Donald Mershberger, which expires April 30, 2004. And uh, recommend that the first alternate, Mark Winkle, be moved to full membership. Second alternate, Brian Versey, be moved to first alternate. Richard Lindy will serve as second alternate. Signed by the mayor. That we can confirm? We can do that with the other one. Okay. The other is uh, Jason Borden, be considered for the Citizens Advisory Committee on Community Development to fill the unexpired term of Sean Severson, which expires April 30, 2004. Signed by the mayor. Alderman Groff. Can I now move that your, uh, your appointments be confirmed? We have a motion before us in a second. Under discussion. Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Public forum, Pat. Brandon, did you want to speak again? Your name is first on here. Uh, again, my name is Brandon Jensen, legislative director for the union. <laughs> I just thank you for the opportunity to be up here today. I wasn't quite sure on the, the procedure with the public hearing versus the public forum, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you, and hopefully I won't be back here in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Ed Project. Edward Prochek, uh, 1215 South 13th Street, Sheboygan. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I, too, was, uh, was here this evening and was not quite aware of how we were going to be doing things. And we had a public forum, and I think the words are pretty much said by Brandon. But at this point, I would think that rather than be remiss, buses go down the roads, and the roads do need to be in good shape. And I would like to, at this time, thank the Department of Public Works for such a great job they did on some treacherous roads that we had in this city this winter with some heavy snow and because of that we are able to stay on time and get a lot of people back and forth to work so I, I like to use my time to thank the other city workers for their a job well done. Thank you. How about Richard Riley? Is he here? He's not here? Henry Capitolo? <coughs> Henry Capitolo, Home Inc. The reason I wanted to speak today is I know that you're going to be start looking at the budget and budgetary things that you're going to be reviewing. Um, I just want to let you know that the action that you take on your expenditures and how you spend money directly impacts a lot of the community and in, in various areas that you may not even realize, but it does. Um, I'll give you an example. The water utility now has gone up. I read in the paper it's going up to 16 percent. We're now looking that we provide laundry service for the residents at Superior Manor, which is the boarding house. We're finding that now with the added cost of uh, sewer uh, maintenance or the uh, uh, water uh, utility fee that we have, the uh, stormwater sewer fee now that we're going to have to pay, the added increase in the water utility, we no longer can provide free laundry service to the residents that we have there. The residents that we have, the majority, I'm going to say 90% of them, are low income. They cannot afford even hardly to make the, the rent, let alone go out and pay for laundry and, and certain things like that. We now have to look at charging them to do that. So what happens is when you make the decisions to spend 
the money that you're entrusted to do. Uh, another example is that I was just reading in the paper that we're talking about extending the, the water uh, inlet pipe, and, and you're talking about three to four million dollars, that an expenditure that's going to be included on there, for the possibility that it froze, what, once in a hundred years. You have to look at the cost that you're, you're spending. And in part of that news article it said, uh, I think they were, they were quoting the mayor, that part of that money, yes, is coming from the state, where that'll be covered. But the other, the other thing that it mentioned in that, uh, that news article is that, well, of course, the people that use the, and utilize water are going to have to pay extra to pay a portion of that. Well, if you're already looking that you've increased 16% for, for the water utility, and you're now talking about more money that you're, you're, you're looking to spend, how much more are you going to increase the utility service for that? Is that going to be another 15%, 20%? We look at it, and it directly affects us. We had to pay our property tax, taxes this year. Over $17,000 is what we paid. We as an organization basically are losing money. And we're willing to provide these services, but I think what happens is we also have to look at the fees that we have to pay and also the cost that, that comes back to, to the citizens. What I look at is our clients and the hardships that they have. And I can, I can envision what uh, a, a retired couple that maybe has worked all their life, bought their home, don't, doesn't have a mortgage, but they still have to pay property taxes. And you say, well, you know, we didn't increase property taxes. But you know what happens? The value of that home did increase. That directly influenced the, the amount of property taxes that that elderly couple now paid. Now you're looking at with the added cost of the water fee. Well, that's now an additional cost. Now we're looking at the use of their water is going to be more. That's another cost. Now, if this family, if this couple is on Social Security and they're on a fixed income, where are they going to get that money to pay for all those added costs? These are the individuals that really are going to be impact on the decisions that you make and how you spend the money within the city. Granted, you know, you need to provide services, you need to look at what you have to build on the infrastructure, but I think that you also have to realize that where is that money coming from? Part of it is from the general revenue, but a lot of it comes from the taxes that you collect and the fees that you impose. It's going to get to the point where you're going to have so many fees and so many taxes that you just will not be able to maintain. So definitely I would, I would ask you to look at seriously what an impact you have when you start looking at making additional expenditures. Thank you very much. Okay. That's all I have. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alder McGrath. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, I'd pull forward document 2341. And along with that, also 2352 and 47, please. Sure, those two. Thank you. For other matters. <laughs> Alder McGrath. I would then move that the RC 2341, which is uh, regarding the Federal Year 2004 One-Year Action Plan for Community Development Block Grants, that that RC be accepted and adopted, and that the substitute ordinance be put upon its passage in 52 and 40, document 2352 and 2347 be uh, filed. So it's a resolution, not an ordinance. Oh, excuse me. It's a resolution, that that resolution be accepted and adopted. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, we have a motion on the floor in a second. Under discussion. Your Honor, I have to make um, two amendments. The first one um, is regarding the substitute resolution, and that is uh, to correct some, um, some wording in, the, uh, in that document. Uh, if you go down to paragraph four, which starts off, um, whereas the Citizen Advisory Committee for Community Development has recommended to the Common Council um, those words should be deleted the Common Council and instead has recommended to the Committee on Finance 
And then um, in five, whereas the Citizens Advisory Committee for Community Development further, those words be deleted and replaced with Committee on Finance. In paragraph six, which is, whereas the Common Council has reviewed and hereby approves the Citizens Participation Plan, um, the words as amended has to um, be placed in there. And paragraph seven, um, whereas the Common Council finds that it is in the city's best interest to secure the FY 2004 funds for the activities approved by the Citizens Advisory Committee for Community Development, comma, as amended is added. And with those, uh, I would move that um, those amendments be uh, placed, um, be accepted, adopted, and passed. Okay, is there any discussion That's on coming. that? <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor of the amendments? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carried. Okay, Alderman Groff. Then um, the second amendment that I need to make is if you go to the um, to the attached sheet showing the um, public services with the 160,000. Um, at this time, I would move that the following two amendments be made, or three amendments, I guess it is. Uh, the Mong Mutual uh, be reduced from the $1,000 that has been recommended to a zero, and that the Latinas be reduced to zero also, subtracting $1,000 from there, um, and that the $2,000 from there be added to the mental health proposal and uh, allowing that to stay at the $7,000 that was proposed originally by the um, uh, Citizen Advisory Committee. Okay, it's been moved and seconded for the amendments. Under discussion. Under discussion on, on that amendment, just so you um, realize, uh, as, as you heard Song speak, uh, he said uh, that really the $1,000 wouldn't really help them and the $1,000, I looked at the Latinas, and they had requested $180,000, which was more than we had to give out. And I didn't think $1,000 would help them at all for what they were planning on doing. Therefore, um, I know the program and the mental health, and I thought, uh, if anywhere, um, they could use it there. Under discussion. Hearing none on amendments, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. Then as amended, I would move that the resolution be, uh, the substitute of the resolution be put upon its passage. Move to second that substitute resolution be put upon its passage. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. I would like to move that uh, we amend the amended resolution as, as it has been amended uh, to reflect the, uh, the following amounts. Uh, I, I understand that the uh, Mong Mutual Assistance Association has uh, declined the amount that was awarded to them, and I understand that Alderman Groff would like to see that amount and the amount of Latinas Urias go to the, uh, the mental health. What I would like to propose is, in my motion would be that we that we take. Uh, I thought that we take that we do nineteen thousand dollars for the Sheboygan uh, Boys and Girls Club, and that would uh, release one one thousand dollars, and that we do the uh, let's see here one thousand dollars from the transit fund, which would leave forty one thousand dollars and assign that amount to the Even Start Club or organization. And the reason I say that, uh, $1,000 from the transit system is automatically going to go back to the uh, transit system. The Even Start programs uh, uses that money to buy tokens for people to ride the bus. And not only do they use that money to ride the bus, but they also use that money to educate people so that they may be aware of the importance and necessity of the, of the, uh, of the transit system. And in doing so, we're, we're putting the money back into the transit system. 
Alderman Perez. Okay. I want a clarification. Nineteen thousand from the boys and girls. I'm and sorry. A thousand no, 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 no. It's twenty thousand. One thousand from, which would leave nineteen thousand. I'm sorry. I'm still not understanding this. You're taking one thousand from boys and girls club. Oh, because right. you had mentioned nineteen thousand. I believe there are three thousand in even start. They wanted three thousand. And I you're funding them two thousand. No, there's nothing there now. Oh, it's proposed three thousand. It was proposed three thousand. He wants to give them two. Okay. Right. I hear you. So you don't want to fully fund it. You just want to go to two thousand. Two thousand. Yes. I, I've had spoken to, uh, actually they've called me before and they said that if they could at least get that much, that money would in turn come back to the, uh, to the transit system in the form of tokens and education, uh, the educational process that they do with the, with the parents and uh, with the needy children that they you train them to use a, the bus system. Was there a second? Do I second? Second. Okay, we have a motion before us and a second. Under discussion. <coughs> Alderman McGraw. Your Honor, um, and even started would be a great program. They were not award, awarded anything during 2003, um, and because taking a thousand dollars out of the transit is like taking five thousand dollars out of there because of the matching funds that we do get when we right. we do spend a thousand dollars, we get four additional <coughs> dollars back. I could not support this amendment. Is there any other place you'd recommend taking a thousand dollars? Any one of you? Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. Why don't we use the uh, the $1,000 that were taken from the Mung Mutual Assistance Association and put it in here? Um, I would have no objection to that, I guess. Would you amend your amendment? Yes, I would to reflect that. Do I have a second? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Hold it. There's an, amend there's, a, there's an amendment that has been passed. No, excuse no, me. No, it hasn't. Yes, it has. Yeah. The amendment was passed to take the thousand dollars from Mung Mutual and give them to Mental Health. Okay, so it's okay. going to come from. So we got to vote that down. Well, no, that's been passed already. Okay. So if if one would make the amendment to take it away from Mental Health, the one thousand dollars, and give it to Even Start. Right. And leave the thousand dollars in transit. Right. Right. That's what. That's the motion. That's what I, I would mean. Yes. Is that okay? I'll do it then. Oh my God. Now do I have a second? Yes. Okay. Um. Now, is everybody on board? You know what's Alderman Rainflesh. For clarification, please. Yeah, hang on. Um, <laughs> we're we've already taken the thousand out of Hmong uh, mutual assistance and given it to the mental health program, correct? So actually, the amendment is taking a thousand mm -hmm. from mental health. Then. That's, That's what right. I said. Is what we're yep. doing, and as, uh, I just want a uh, clarification from Alderman Perez is that's really what he's looking at doing. Thank you. We're not taking it away. We're just not going to add it on based on the recommendation that the Finance Committee made. You're just going with what the Finance Committee recommended. Right. Under regular In this instance. Yes. But the net result would still would be that Mental Health uh, Association uh, then gets 6,000 6, instead of the 7,000. Correct. Right. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Everyone understand the amendment? To the amendment? Sure. All right. Be ready tomorrow. All in favor of the amendment? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carried. Now we go back to as amended. As amended. I will move that the re uh, resolution be put upon its passage. The substitute resolution. We have a motion before us under discussion. Anyone want to make a amendment? Alderman Doyle. Now, is this on the big picture itself? Yes. Okay. Well, I'd like to speak for the citizens of the community. Uh, it's always difficult to make a decision when the Common Council has to choose between two causes. Should the community development block grant monies be taken away from the local charitable organizations selected by the Citizen Committee and given to Sheboygan Transit? Who's more deserving of this money? Will more people benefit if the transit gets the money or if the charitable organizations receive it? For those of you that uh, went to the Finance Committee meeting or have listened tonight, it's pretty obvious where the aldermen stand on this issue. They favor the uh, transit situation and they feel that there's all these people out there that need rides that are absolutely dependent for their livelihood on these rides. Now if I talk to the residents of the community, I get a totally different picture. 
I get more comments about the transit situation than I do about anything except winter parking rules. The three comments go like this, the three categories of comments that I get go like this. Doyle, there was no one on that bus but the, rider, but the driver. The second one is, why do we need such big buses for so few passengers? The third one, do we need this Cadillac bus service in Sheboygan? That's the feedback from the community. Now, who's correct, the public or, or the aldermen? Well, I would guess that not many of the aldermen in, in this room have ridden the bus. I did for 10 years. I got the bus on Erie Avenue, rode down to the transfer point, walked over to the school district building where I was an administrator three times a week for 10 years or more. The bus drivers were courteous. The service was great. The schedule was wonderful. I didn't need a ride. My wife and I have two cars. But it was a public service supported by the taxpayer, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll be a good citizen to support it. But the citizens are right. There were few riders on those buses. There was many, many times where the driver and I were the only one on the bus. Bus systems have two major problems in the United States. One is high cost, the other is low ridership. Bus systems are incredibly costly. The state and federal government provide huge incentives, taxpayer incentives, to run these buses. Otherwise, small cities like Sheboygan could not even think of running a bus. It is money that is not that well spent because so few people in this country, in small cities, use the service. How much does this service cost? Well, I'm just getting this out of the newspaper. Riders pay roughly 17% of the cost of transit. That means the taxpayer is paying 83% of the cost of transit. If the 17%, if you set up a ratio, that's a dollar and a half fare, that means that the cost per rider is approximately nine to ten dollars per rider. In other words, the taxpayer is paying seven to nine dollars in addition to that fare every time the person gets on the bus. Now, mass transit studies are old. Are there cities where lots of people ride the bus? Well, in order for a lot of people to ride the bus in America, the city has to have three characteristics. They have to have high population density, which we don't have. They have to have lots of massive traffic jams where people don't want to uh, drive. We don't have that. When you arrive at your destination, there has to be a very high cost of parking. We don't have that. So we don't meet any of the criteria for high bus ridership. In the United States, New York City is literally the only one that really has major bus service. If you go to small cities in Wisconsin like Waukesha, Racine, Kenosha, you'll see the same thing you do in Sheboygan, largely empty buses. Why are there so few bus riders in the United States in small cities? Five reasons. The first one is the American love of the automobile. Uh, Americans have always loved motorized vehicles, be it snowmobiles, ATVs, you name it, they want to be driving their car. The second reason they don't want to take buses is autos are far more convenient than buses. If I would choose when I was working to drive downtown, it was 10 to 15 minutes. If I took the bus, even with the excellent service, 30 minutes. More convenient to ride, a, ride your own car. There's social barriers to bus ridership. Most people, unfortunately, for better or for worse, if they're middle class or up, think they're too good to ride the bus. The fourth one, crime factor. People feel safer riding in their own auto than they do riding in a bus, especially if they meet a tough teenager. Fifth problem is the percentage of people needing bus service in the United States constantly goes down every year. So what does the future hold? Bus ridership will continue to decrease in Sheboygan because groups who use it now are less likely to use it in the future. The six main groups are these. Elderly women. If you go back in US history, there was a time when Papa went to work, Mama stayed home and raised the kids, and she didn't have a driver's license. That generation is almost gone now. Women growing up all have driver's licenses. The second category is the poor. The United States 
says this constitute the poverty level, a certain dollar figure. But poverty in the United States is not the same as poverty in Haiti. 70% of people that are declared to be poor in the United States drive a car. The statistics show that more will in the future. So the number of poor people that will have a car is increasing all the time. The third thing is <coughs> students. Studies, students used to ride buses, but because of crime concerns, elementary students now are driven by their parents. When they get to high school, they drive their own car rather than take a bus. And if you don't believe me, go to North High School and try to find a parking spot. Next category, handicapped people. Handicapped people used to take the bus, but now cars are being fitted for handicapped people so that handicapped people can drive. The last category is the elderly with medical problems used to take the buses, but now the federal government through Medicaid or Medicare is providing scooters, and the people are driving these scooters instead of taking the bus. So every category of major bus rider ship potential is decreasing in the United States. Hard times. Money is limited. We must make hard choices as a common council. What have we done already? In order to keep the buses running, we have reduced library services. We provide fewer recycling center services come this summer. Fewer police officers on the street. Fewer people to serve the public at City Hall. If you look at capital expenditures, we keep having to buy buses but we can't afford a police station. To summarize, it will not be possible to get Sheboyganites out of their car and riding buses. There are a few people out there who need bus service, but studies show that it's very few. How long will we continue to run big buses with professional drivers to meet the needs of a tiny group of people and then turn around and cut one major service after another to 50,000 people? We simply don't have enough people to, to justify the present level of bus service that we have. With respect to the funds that are at stake tonight, I feel it would be better spent on the charitable organizations. Thank you. Alderman Wright Flesh, thank you. It's tough act to follow. Uh, I do think that um, tonight we've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of people speaking out on both sides of the issue, money to transits with the federal match, money to the charities that, that need them as well. And um, Char had a comment, Sarpakniak had a comment at the, at the uh, Finance Committee Thursday. It's the good versus the good. You know, we're putting two services that may be very useful to individuals against each other, and that's just not fair. Uh, the thing that I heard that most intrigued me on Thursday, however, is that uh, we're currently, with the 46,000 or 45,000 here, 46, that um, we're using from the Community Development Block Grants, uh, and the 80% match that we're getting, or the $4 per every dollar uh, that we're getting, is already in this year's budget. Um, and the reason why the, sh the cuts would have to be made is because we're operating already two months into that budget year, operating on the assumption that we already had this $46,000 plus the match from the federal government. My concern is, is to the advisory committee, those that sat down and uh, interviewed all of the, the various groups, decide what programs were worthy, um, if it was the case that a decision was made ahead of time that we needed this money to operate the buses, um, they should have been told that. that. They should have been told that they did not have 160 to give out. They only had 114,000 to give out out of the 501,000 uh, worth of requests. I think that would have stopped a lot of the uh, bad blood, the bad feelings. They've been able to make tough decisions right away, knowing the, the impact, uh, and they would not have felt that that their <coughs> advice to the Finance Committee wasn't just changed a little bit to meet the bigger picture, but rather changed outright. Um, so hopefully next year, if we're doing this again, that we communicate that, that to the advisory group ahead of time, that's a certain dollar amount we're looking at using for the match from the federal government as well, uh, so that, that at the beginning of the process, they understand fully what dollar amount they have to use. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and at that, Ron, would you like to speak on that at this point? Actually, it was 42,000, Eric, not 46. But I'd like to have Ron touch base on that because I don't feel it was allocated before the Citizen Advisory Group got to start. That's correct, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, there were no promises that there would be money uh, available. Uh, this is the uh, third year 
that we were hoping to receive funds. Uh, two years ago, we received $36,000. Uh, last year, the Citizens Board recommended that we receive $46,000. Uh, this council uh, saw that the Literacy Council had been overlooked and was granted zero, or recommended to have zero, so they took $5,000 from transit and reallocated it to the Literacy Council. Um, I, I agree, we're, we're, we're pitting good against good. You know, I, I'm, I don't have any issue with the, the agencies that are out there. They're all fine agencies. Um, but there wasn't any money promised to us. Yes, we did budget for it. And as we go through our budget process, for us to be able to leverage state and federal dollars and all that goes along with it, we do have to put that into our, our budget or we can't go after the state and federal dollars along with it. So we're, we're not going to get the bang for the buck. Um, if we didn't budget for it, this service wouldn't be out there and we'd have to be looking at eliminating the service and re-implementing it a few months down the road. So that's why the service is out there uh, and that's why it was budgeted for, I guess. Does that explain why Thank we you. did it that way? Thank you. Alderman Wong, oh, go ahead. Um, I guess then better communication next year involved with that. What we're budgeting for uh, needs to be communicated even before a decision is made, which they've just made now, so they have a better understanding of what they're really working with. If that's the case, uh, I don't think they want to have any service cutbacks, but my understanding is they didn't really know that if they didn't fund, how, what, to what extent the cutbacks would, ha would occur. So I just hope for more communication amongst the departments so that they understand in the budget process where money from one end really impacts something on another end. Thank you. I appreciate that, Alderman. Uh, I guess and, uh, one of the reasons that we, we are transit budgeted for that money uh, and, and had a, a under, assumption that we might get it was that during last year's proposal, I was asked directly if this is something we expected to come back each year for. And when I answered yes to it, the committee really had, had no comment to it. And uh, uh, when they awarded us the $46,000 last year, I, you know, that was pretty indicative that we were favorable uh, with the committee. And, and then, uh, uh, quite frankly, and then getting this year where we asked for $42,000 uh, and we're, we're knocked away to zero, um, you know, that was, it was quite a surprise. No, I understand. Thank you, Ron. Alderman Wagaman. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I have to completely support Alderman Doyle. He's, he stole all my thunder from me, but uh, he perhaps put it far more eloquently than I could. But whenever I go out, and I went out today, and I talked to people, and I made phone calls, and Alderman Doyle is correct. The people really can't understand the transit system. All they see are huge buses driving around with nobody in them. Not to try and be funny, but one man said, you know the ad where the washing machine repairman is so lonely. He said, the only guy lonelier is a city bus driver because there's nobody with him. Uh, and Alderman Doyle is right. I, I looked at, tonight as I walked up, I saw four city buses pull out of the transit thing down here and there was one person on there. And it's time that we realize, yes, the bus company is federally funded. There's a lot of federal funding going into it, but that's tax money too. And the people said, you know, where does that money come from? It comes from us. And the only thing I can do is paraphrase Winston Churchill, never has so many people paid so much money to benefit so few people. Our transit system is probably a dying breed. They're all over, Jerry's right, all over the country. Ridership is decreasing everywhere. There's no prospect in the future that it's going to increase. And I just find it incomprehensible that we would transfer extra money to the Transit Authority when we have the Mead Public Library gets nothing. And I bet you there's 10 times more people use the library than ever dream about using the bus system. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Stephan. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I will miss Alderman Doyle. He always puts a lot of thought and his heart into his comments. And I, I really think he, he made the argument for me and why we should support the transit when, you know, I'm just going to trust his numbers when he said the, the riders pay 17% of the costs. And the citizens of Sheboygan, through our general fund, pay 3% of the cost, and the other 80 comes from the federal government. Now, you're right, those are tax dollars. I'm not arguing that whatsoever, but I'm guaranteeing you, if we don't take them, somebody else is. So I think if you ask the citizens, you know, if 3% of the cost of the bus service in Sheboygan was on the Sheboygan tax levy, you know, I don't think they'd 
be worried about the size of the buses and, and how many people are doing it. And I think if, if you sat in a finance meeting or the transit and listened to the numbers, you know, people see it when it's empty. They don't see it when it's full. You ask the numbers. You, they've got the numbers of how many riders there are. You'd be shocked. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Warner. I uh, Thank you, Your Honor. I, we're having a really good discussion here tonight, and I think that's healthy. Um, I will support the amended, amended recommendations of the Finance Committee for the 2004 one-year action plan regarding funds from the Community Development Black, Black Grant Program. And I think the Finance Committee is a parent committee of the Citizens Advisory Committee for Community Development has, in my opinion, exercised its obligation of oversight for the Black Grant Program. Every organization that applied for these funds is certainly worthy. However, there's not enough funding to meet every request. The advisory committee did its job and brought forth its conclusions. The finance committee did its job, reviewed those conclusions, and made changes it felt were necessary and in the best interest of the city as a whole. And at this time, I think the transit <coughs> system fits that part for the city as a whole that 30% of people that Alderman Doyle referred to who have no other means of getting around the city. 30% of the citizens of Sheboygan, or 30% of the people who need, the, need that service. Maybe not 30% of the citizens of Sheboygan, but that 30% out there that still uses transit. I realize that not everyone is happy with the results, but no matter what changes are made, someone will not like it. We have been through a very difficult budget year and the upcoming year will be difficult as well. We as a council will have to make some very tough choices and the citizens will have to realize that we cannot continue to provide all the same services at the same levels with less funding year after year. Something will have to give and we will be under significant pressure from all directions. I am confident we will do our best as I believe the finance and its subcommittee have done in this case. I support their amended recommendations, including the funding of transit. Transit is a subsidized necessity at this time in the city of Sheboygan. Perhaps like you all say, maybe someday it won't be, but right now it is. Just like our school systems are subsidized by the property tax payers, a lot of them don't have kids in school, but we still pay over a third of our taxes to the school system for our schools. To me, that means something. There are things you pay for that don't directly impact you. And those people that get on those buses and need to get to work have to have a way to get there. Perhaps someday we'll have moving sidewalks, I don't know. But right now, I think we need to keep the transit system running at a minimum level so that these people can get to their jobs and to work. They can't even get to the uh, charity, charitable organizations that provide services to them without transit, some of these people. There's no other way. And if you look at the costs of the, the county system for the elderly on, I forget the name of that system right now, Handicare, if you want to see a, an expensive deal, I believe that's something like $75 an hour that the city pays towards that. I mean, that's expensive. But you know what? It's needed. Those are the things societies do as a minimum and eventually, when they're not needed, of course we won't be running buses, but right now they are. And people talk about the large buses. Well, you know what? The small buses rattle, shake, and fall apart, cost more to repair by far than the large buses. If you go to the Transit Commission, if you ask the Director of Transit what's happening with those buses, they'll tell you. They'll tell you why the larger buses are better. It's not just because they take up more room on the road, it's because they last longer. They're built stronger, they're built better. That reduces maintenance costs in the long run we save. That's something I learned on a transit commission. So I think this is a good recommendation. Not everybody's going to be happy, but this is the way we should go. Okay, thank you. Alderman Reinflash, back to you. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in the budget process, I, the reason why we do it on an annual basis to me is promises made. That we can give a dollar amount to various departments within the city. This is what you have to work with. They come up with a budget and they make do with that. Um, are there areas for perhaps improvement in the transit? I don't know. I'm not an expert on transit. Um, maybe, but that's something that needs to be investigated and over time. Uh, needs to put some serious thought into it. Um, looking at the dollars per rider is some, something very important. Look at the individuals that, that rely on that. Maybe there's better ways that we can get them around. That's not something that we're going to get done today, though. We've already made the promise for the riders. I'm talking, not talking about the management, but the riders to expect that service through this year. And I think 
you know, despite what happened with the surprise and the miscommunication perhaps between the advisory committee and the finance committee, I think it's a promise that we have to keep for those riders this time around and not cut back service. Um, I, I also think that the two amendments that we've made today um, perhaps brings the spirit of what the intent of the advisory committee was. Now obviously we did not reallocate $46,000 here, we only allocated about $4,000, but hopefully the promise that they made to those departments, we are better able today to, to change and keep the promise to them as well. Uh, so I will support this. I will also support perhaps looking at the service and as a way to save money, but today right now I will support it as amended. Thank you. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. Just a couple of quick comments. One uh, would be that uh, I would advise uh, whoever is capable of doing it, I uh, know that some of us may not be here after April, including myself, uh, that perhaps we consider putting together an educational program so that all of us seem to know bits and pieces of why the transit system is so cr critical and so crucial to this community. Uh, I understand it. I'm not so sure that a lot of the people out in the community do. When we hear, we hear often, buses are empty. Why do we need those big buses? They're costing us money. Uh, Alderman Warner had some good comments right now to address that particular issue. But all of us seem to have information that's, that's, uh, that's important to the community that we should use to educate the community so that they can buy into the transit system. Uh, most of us have bought into the transit system, but the public perception now out in the community is you don't need such a huge bus to drive around one person around town. You don't need to have empty buses. That's the public perception. Whether we like it or not, we need to address that. So I, I would urge that somebody look into that. Perhaps uh, Mr. McDonald could look into that. The other uh, comment that I'd like to make is, again, with respect to the, the process. Other aldermen have already talked about it. But I would hope that this council would not have to deal with the situation again. Somehow, somewhere, in some way, we should communicate to the people who are applying for these funds that the Citizens Advisory Committee is exactly that, an advisory committee. And the council does have the authority and the power to override any, any advice from, from that committee. If they understand that, and if they choose not to serve, and I say that because I was in the advisory committee and there was countless hours and meetings and time, and I know the nonprofit organizations put amounts of hours and time too, and for them to, to be awarded an amount by the advisory committee or, or propose an, an amount, there's a, a certain amount of uh, reliability on that. People start relying on that amount coming in and they start, they start budgeting for that money, and then to have it yanked out of them, it's not a good thing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is somehow if we can communicate to all these organizations and our community, we're trying to do the best job we can. There's only so much to go around. Not everybody's going to get what they want. But somehow we need to make sure that the perception out there in the community is that we're doing it fair. I guess you already have that tool in place, Alderman Perez. I would hope the next committee of the whole chairman would bring that up. Okay. And we could have uh, Director McDonald up here and present what the transit system really means to our community. Good. Thank you. Alderman Moody. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Nineteen years ago, I was appointed to Citizens Advisory Committee on Community Development by our former Mayor Richard Schneider. And that was how I got my start in politics. It seemed back then that we had a lot more money and a lot less requests for that money. I can remember we planted trees, we put lights in Kiwanis Park, and, and uh, these are much more needy things now than ever before. We never had all this. And uh, I guess addressing the transit in all the traveling that my husband and I have done, some of the communities like Seattle, a certain inner area of Seattle, the, the bus rides are free. But who pays for that? Of course, the businesses and, and the attractions and things like that. Maybe in future years, we need to talk to like the, the businesses in the industrial park, the outlying shopping areas, Blue Harbor, see if the private sector can contribute to keep that transit system going. Otherwise, I don't know what we're going to do. I believe that was already tried, but it doesn't hurt to go back and uh, mm -hmm. re-talk. Okay. Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. Just to make a few comments on what was all said, um, just to, to let um, Alderman Moody know, um, yes, that was tried, and I'm sure it will be tried again and brought up at, at future transit meetings. Also, um, to let all the aldermen know that Kurt Jackson, who is the chairman of the Citizen Advisory Committee for Community Development Block Grant, um, 
he and I have been, been talking back and forth on, on by email. And um, after the last Finance Committee meeting, he uh, wrote to me saying, I just wanted to let you know that I will support the Finance Committee's recommendation 100%. I believe in the democratic process. We may disagree on issues, but we still must work together for the good of the city. And that's what the Finance Committee tried to do with their recommendations. Um, we did take into consideration the fact that 85% of the ridership of the buses are low and middle income. And that's what some of these funds are, are supposed to be used, or these funds are supposed to be used for low and middle income. In addition to that, um, Mr. Jackson had also recommended that possibly next year, and um, I will put that in as, as one of um, the things that should be done by the next Finance Committee or Finance Committee Chairman, due to the fact that the Citizen Advisory Committee is an is a, um, advisory committee to the Finance um, Committee. Mr. Jackson had recommended that maybe we should have a joint committee meeting prior to distribution to make sure that we, we know from each other what we kind of expect and what we um, kind of determine. So that's something else that's in the process. And uh, uh, one final thing is the same thing that we did to um, Boys and Girls Club this year. We, we announced to them, okay, you know, we have these funds for you, but this will be your last year. And I don't know if it was done the prior year or not, but uh, this year we did write them a letter and we told them that we will not be uh, contributing th to them out of, um, out of our um, room tax dollars any longer. And um, the same thing needs to be done here. When the advisory committee did uh, their distribution, they looked at only uh, including nonprofits. That is a policy. Now, if that policy should be made or is desired to be made, that needs to be addressed by either the Finance Committee or the Common Council as a whole. If that's what we're going to do with, with, these block grant, black, with these block grant funds in the future to only use them for nonprofit organizations, then that's the policy that we should adopt and follow. And um, with that, I hope um, we have enough support on, um, for this document to, to pass it. No other discussion, Pat? Everyone knows what they're voting on? Would you like? Don't ask me to repeat this. <laughs> OK. I think you all know. Roll call, please. Berg? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? No. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? 14 ayes, 2 noes. Motion carries. Thank you all for coming this evening. Consent agenda, Alderman Groff. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, let's see. For items 21, 23 1 through 23 20, I would move that we accept and file all our O's, accept and adopt all our C's, pass the resolutions and the ordinance. Moved and second, accept and File all ROs, pass the resolutions and ordinance, and accept adopt RCs from 231 through 2320. Alderman Stefan. Uh, yes, Your Honor. I would just request a roll call on 236, please. 236. We'll handle that first. You want it separate, in other yep. words. Yeah. In a roll. Do that one first, Pat. Would you call the roll on 236? Any if, is there any discussion on 23.6 before we call Alderman Montemayor? No. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a little bit of information. The other two communications that the council received that were referred to the ethics board, anything happened? Where are they? What yes. has happened? They're still I'm wondering. In committee. They're in a committee. They're in committee when he decides to in call a meeting. Which committee are they in? Ethics, ethics. board. They're in the ethics board folder. When he decides to for have a the meeting, right. then they will be discussed. Okay. Is that a long time to wait? Or no. this is, it's not? No. Thank you. Boards do not have to report out on their documents in a special time. They can go from year to year to year if you want. Same oh, as commissions. Let's hope not. Thank you. <laughs> no, I don't like it either. Right. Okay. Would you call the roll, please? Bonet. 236. This is a file 236. Doyle, Groff, Manny, Montemayor, Moody, Aye. Perez, Rinfleisch, Stefan, Van Akron, Vanderweel, Wangaman, Warner, Aye. Weininger, Aye. Bauman, Aye. Berg. 
He excused. Oh, I know. He had there. to leave. I didn't see him leave. Fifteen eyes. Motion carried. What time did he leave? Is there anything else under consent agenda? Alderman Van Ackerd. I just got a question on 2310. Okay. Uh, I think Tom or somebody could answer it for me. Was Mr. Thiel notified of what's happening on this on this Commerce Street? We'll be notified. He was invited to come into committee and didn't come to committee. So after this action tonight, we'll send a letter out to him. Has there been any dates or anything that this is going to be done? No, we don't know. We have to get the money first. This wasn't figured in with the rock line deal? Not the total reconstruction. No, it should be done because of the drainage. Thank you. Okay. Do you have another discussion? Would you call the roll, Pat? Doyle? Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Rinfly? Stephan? Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Longerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 23, 21, and 22 to be referred. 23, 23 through 23, 31 to be referred. 2332 by Alderman McGraw, author, authorizing retaining outside legal counsel to represent the city in a matter of Brian S. Warwick versus the city of Sheboygan. Alderman McGraw. Yeah, and I'd like to ask for a suspension. The move to second for suspension. Is there any objections? Hearing none, proceed. Then I would ask that the resolution be put upon its passage. Move to second a resolution be put upon its passage. Under discussion, Alderman Reinflesch. Uh, thank you. Just a point of clarification why specifically we're hiring outside legal counsel. Is there a conflict of interest on this one? Is it workload? I'm not familiar with the case at all. So, uh, Alderman Reinfleisch, uh, the uh, summons and complaint is, is document 2329. It's an uh, uh, auto accident where a uh, police officer was on Indiana Avenue, pulled over to the curb. Uh, Mr. Mahorek's vehicle was driving along. The officer uh, saw a traffic violator on the go in the other direction, pulled out, tried to make a U-turn real quick on Indiana, and there was a, a side swipe with uh, the Mahorek vehicle. So he's filing a claim against the city. He actually filed two claims. He filed an individual claim by himself for about uh, I can't remember what the amount of damage was. Uh, I want to say 2000 or $3,000. Uh, there was discussion with them. Uh, we almost thought we had it settled. Uh, we sent a letter to him asking him to confirm that that amount was uh, fine and sign a release form. Uh, I think the day before that was received by him, he had contacted an attorney and we got another claim then on the same incident for $150,000. So that's, that's what this is, a $150,000 claim. And, and th this is covered by Cities and Villages Mutual Insurance. It's one of our insurance claims. And we've been using the, uh, Jim Conway and the Olson Clowett firm for defense of these, these sorts of claims. So it's not costing us to, uh, any additional to hire outside. It's part of our, our insurance program or our well, cleaning program? we're self-insured. We've got a self-insured retention level. So we have to pay up to that, I think it's $75,000 per claim. And we have to pay for attorney fees as well. Uh, but if it, if it exceeds that amount, then we're covered by the insurance. Okay, and we, in consultation with cities and villages uh, discuss using outside counsel and they recommend using Mr. Conway of that Very firm. Good. Thank you. Alderman Perez. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just a quick question. Do we have any guidelines that guide us as far as how, you know, how we go about hiring outside legal counsel under what circumstances and so forth? Um, on the, all the small claims that or, are insurance okay. claims, we're doing in-house. We're doing in-house. But when we do hire outside counsel for whatever reason, is, do we have any guidelines or any, anything that we follow? Uh, just 
we're part of SIBMIC, as I say, SIBMIC's got uh, their, uh, their concerns as far as who, uh, who we select for outside counsel and they have input because they're our insurance company okay. and they recommend using Olson Clowett. Uh, we've been using them on these sorts of claims for the last four or five years and we've been very successful. Okay. Uh, we haven't had many where uh, we've had to pay out. Um, so that's, it's really, you know, past practice that we've been using that firm and have had good success on. All right, uh, thank you. With that firm. Well, I was just wondering, problem with that or? Pardon me? Was there a problem with that or? No, no, no. And it is no. uh, a local firm. Right. No, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay, I just, uh, no, I, I just wasn't sure if, how exactly we made a determination, because people ask, you know, how do you decide who to hire? And we I use local firms if we can. Good, good, thank you. Okay. Would you call the roll, please? Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Carriz? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderwil? Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? 15 eyes. Motion carried. 2333, resolution by Alder and Groff, authorizing the sale of 1,500,000 1, general obligation promissory notes, series 2004A, 1,065,000 general obligation promissory notes, 2004B, and 3,200,000 taxable bond anticipation notes, series 2004C. Alder and Groff. Do I need suspension? Oh. No. Then I would ask that the resolution be put upon its passage. Okay. Moved and second, the resolution be put upon its passage. Alderman Rainflesh. Pretty much the question I have every time we look at this, uh, what is the effect on our city's ranking, uh, our ability to uh, issue new bonds with this? Is Rich here? Rich is not here this evening. Steve, do you have? But I can't really address I, that. You mean on our, our rating? For for, this is still within the guidelines that we had established um, after the last council or the last budget process that we had to retain so much, and um, this would still be within that those limits. We're still in the three yeah. percent under the three percent cap, but the self-imposed cap. That three percent cap there has been. That three percent cap has been approved by our bond council. Yes. That's as we're still getting that rating that's somewhat Correct. iffy, but we're still there. Correct. Right. Okay. And if we will go over if we would go over we'd have to come back to council for approval. <coughs> which I don't foresee us doing. Okay, if there's no other discussion, Pat would you call the roll? Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderbilt? Aye. Longerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? Graf? Aye. 15 eyes. Motion carried. 2334 will lie over. 2335 through 39 to be referred. 2340. Public Protection and Safety. Recommending denial beverage license 5542 based on criminal record which makes the applicant ineligible. Denying beverage operator's license 6300 based on criminal records which makes the applicant ineligible. And denying taxi cab driver's license 6301 based on applicant not revealing all information as requested. Alderman Doyle. Moved and second, accept and adopt the report of committee. Under discussion. Yes, sir, Your Honor. Is uh, Mr. Coulter, Mr. Stolb, or Mr. Kaler here tonight? No, they aren't, Your Honor. You can proceed. Okay. <coughs> Under discussion, Alderman Montemayor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm back on 2336. We're on 2340. Well, we're on 2340. Finish that first. Okay. Then All right. Ask for the other then I will stand again. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. That's okay. If there's no other discussion, would you call the roll? Montemayor? On 2340, right? Yes. Right. Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Ben Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangeman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Weininger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. 
15 ayes. Motion carried. 2336, Alderman Montemayor, you have a Thank question? You. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, a question. Um, the, the John Rost Associates are going to do some work for us. Sounds good. Now, the last page it says investment, approximately 15 to 20 hours of John Rost's time, not to exceed $2,500. The not to exceed $2,500, does that mean a limit of $2,500, or it's just permission to spend $2,500 and might come and ask for more? It has gone to finance. Alderman Groff. Um, thank you, Your Honor. Um, that means that finance is going to discuss it at their next meeting. and. Um, so we will be discussing it at that and um, make a recommendation back to council. That's okay, why it's so being referred. No. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's why it's being referred to finance. Okay, 2342 to be referred. 2241 by Alderman Ballman, authorizing entry into amendment 2241. Wait, oh, we did that. You're right. 2237 by Alderman Winger, Doyle, and Bonet, authorizing transfer appropriations in the 2004 budget. Alderman Winger. Thank you, Your Honor. I make a motion to resolution be put up on this passage. Move to second resolution be put up on this passage under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll, please, Pat? Moody? Aye. Perez? Aye. Rimfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner, Aye. Winninger, Aye. Bauman, Aye. Bonet, Aye. Doyle, Aye. Groff, Aye. Manny, Aye. Montemayor. Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. Just a second. Okay, let's go back one. There's a question. Okay, let's go back to 2241. Was that what you wanted? That's okay. okay. I found it. Okay, 2241, a resolution by Alderman Bowman, authorizing entering to amendment to the current lease extension agreement with the Sheboygan Outboard Club. Alderman Bowman. Thank you, Your Honor. I move that the resolution be put upon its passage. Move to second resolution be put upon its passage under discussion. Hearing none, would you call the roll? Perez? Aye. Rinfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Ben Akron? Aye. Vanderbilt? Aye. Wangaman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Winnegar? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Groff? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. 15 ayes. Motion carried. 2244, GO by Alderman Warner, Moody, Vanderbilt, and Wangaman. No, you got resolution to be passed. You're right. My numbers are too mixed up. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, we got two different agendas here, but that's okay. <laughs> we'll get through it. Amending the code to provide additional regulation of taxi cab companies and the vehicles used by said companies. Alderman Warner. I thank your honor. I make a motion the general ordinance be put upon its passage. Second. Move to second the general ordinance be put upon its passage. Under discussion. Under discussion, your honor, this is an ordinance repealing and recreating section 130.59 of the, of the municipal code so as to provide additional regulation of taxi cab companies and the vehicles used by said companies. Uh, this is something we talked about in the past and uh, what this does is we, we talk to the taxi cab owners in the city, the owners of the companies that came into public protection and safety, and we've been discussing this for over a year, and uh, came to some conclusions that would help provide a better service. And what this does is uh, it makes it unlawful to operate or permit to be operated a vehicle for the convenience of passengers unless it has liability insurance to protect the public, which is, is something that uh, we're putting into the ordinance. Another issue is that uh, taxi cabs shall be inspected by an automotive service excellence, excellence certified technician to ensure that they're safely, safe in uh, operation. And also the taxi cabs may not be put in service until the required safety and maintenance inspection has been completed and the taxi cab has been rated as satisfactory. 
Some of the other issues involved in this is uh, notice of certain occurrences when a taxi cab driver uh, has a violation of a state or local ordinance arising out of taxi cab operation. That would be something that has to be brought forward to, to the committee so that they can look at that to ensure that there's nothing uh, that would preclude that person from having a taxi cab driver's license. And also whether they would have a license suspension or revocation or, or another restriction on, on their license, that would be something that would come forward. Uh, if they're involved in an accident, if there's any death or personal injury or damage or theft caused by a taxi cab or license holder, that is something that would come forward to the committee for discussion. All these issues are public safety issues that we felt should be put into the ordinance. Uh, during the last several months, as I said, the Public Protection and Safety Committee has discussed this ordinance uh, with the owners and operators of, of two local taxi companies that were able to make our meetings. The rest, for one reason or another, uh, did not attend the meetings. Uh, we reached these conclusions with their help and with their input and the Public Protection and Safety Committee recommends passage. Is there another discussion? Would you call the roll please? Greenfleisch? Aye. Stephan? Aye. Van Akron? Aye. Vanderweel? Aye. Wangerman? Aye. Warner? Aye. Wenninger? Aye. Bauman? Aye. Bonnet? Aye. Doyle? Aye. Graf? Aye. Manny? Aye. Montemayor? Aye. Moody? Aye. Perez? 15 ayes. Motion carried. 2343 will go to Special Committee on Risk Management. 2344 goes to the Board of Water Commissioners. 2345 to Finance. 46 will go to Public Works. And 2348 lies over. Steve. I believe 2349 was addressed previously. Yep. 23. No, not 49. That 49? I thought that was with the block ramp. No, that was 47. That was 47. I don't have 49. 49 is transients. All right, I don't, I don't have it handy. You don't have it? No, don't have 49. Here you go, Steve. Twenty-three forty-nine is ordinance amending section seventy-eight of the municipal code, so as to make various revisions relating to transit merchants. I can email everybody. Okay. It's just being recorded. And two. Lies over. Lies over. It lies over. Okay. Twenty-three fifty is an RO by the city clerk's submitting a claim from Gary and Tiffany Clum for alleged damages to their vehicle when it sideswiped by a snowplow. Special committee on risk management. 2351 is a resolution authorizing entering into a contract change order for loading, hauling, and placing 9,000 ton of beach sand cover, uh, extend surface water discharge trench, and excavate haul and place fill for burying Fisherman's Road in order to finish the beach retro restoration project at the South Pier District. Public Works. Hang on, hang on one moment, please. Gentlemen, uh, just want to address one issue. Chief, come up to the microphone, please. Obviously, you've been reading the paper lately with some of the large drug busts in the city of Sheboygan. And I made the comment I will give Chief all the resources or what resources we can give Chief to curtail this drug problem we're having within our city. We were told about 10 years ago, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, that uh, drugs were moving this way, and we've been watching it happen, and now they're here. And I guess fill us in a little bit where we stand and what we need to do. Well, first off, um by some of the actions here tonight, perhaps we should come back where we're a little bit more fresh. I mean, it seems a little lengthy, but given the opportunity, Mark, I won't be that long. Given the opportunity, I certainly will address this council. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me a couple brief minutes to, to address where we are. I want to, I want to first off say several thank you uh, to, to several people. First off, to my employees. They've done a fantastic job. job as far as what they've been working under. They also did a fantastic job in the recent uh, drug seizure. Uh, not only my employees, but my police officers, members of the Sheboygan County MEG unit, members of the Sheboygan County, different law enforcement agencies. This was not our action alone. This involved the Sheboygan County Sheriff's Department. It, it involved almost every agency, law enforcement agency in, in the county. 
It involved the uh, state, its Department of Criminal Investigation, and, and a federal level, the Department of uh, Drug Enforcement Administration. Why and, and how do all these agencies get involved? Because this was a rather large incident, uh, this has implications of being a rather large nation a wide distribution. I will not say much more than that other than at times we need the assistance of the state, we need the assistance of the federal government to come in here uh, to provide uh, various uh, resources. I think it's fantastic under the direction of Deputy Chief Bob Weiss, the Criminal Investigation Division, along with the MEG unit, our Street Crimes Unit was able to pull this off. It was fantastic work by a lot of good people. Second off, uh, I wish to say thank you to the mayor. Uh, you have said repeatedly that you will provide us the resources necessary to, to deal with the drug concerns and the gang concerns. It was a real busy week for us this last week, a lot of domestic arrests. We, of course, had the large drug seizure of over $1 million, a street value of uh, cocaine and almost nine um, kilograms of cocaine. We had I think 80 pounds of marijuana and a methamphetamine. That was the third case of a methamphetamine arrest in the county in the city of Sheboygan within the last year. I wish to say thank you to the mayor for providing his support. I also wish to say thank you to our current employees. We have about 130 employees at the Sheboygan Police Department that have been working under some stressful situations. How and why did we get here tonight? Well, uh, some of this is a, a art, <coughs> excuse me, our department's response to a tight budget. Uh, three years ago, we were working with seven um, vacancies within our law enforcement community, within our police department. Last year, we were down eight officers. This year, we're currently down three. I thank you uh, for allowing us to hire five officers recently. Uh, I believe we are talking at the present time that we would hire one and begin efforts to get to full strength by year 2005. I believe it's ex extremely crucial we get to that point. Why? Because, Mayor, you're absolutely right. We have not, this is not a recent information I provided to you. Approximately four years ago, I said that the community is becoming more violent. We had four homicides later that year. Three years ago, we had three homicides, two homicides two years ago, and two homicides last year. We are seeing a violent community. Some of this violence is the personalization of people, who they are, what we see. Some of it is people coming from the outside communities uh, to serve and deal drugs in our community. Several years ago, after I took uh, office as chief, I spoke on the issue of uh, we needed members for our gang unit. At that time, I was told I could have four officers. I did not receive any. Last year, we made a presentation to the Common Council, the Committee of the Whole, about the drug problem that we're seeing in the, the city of Sheboygan. Uh, we, at one time, were told we would see 10 more officers. We have not. Part of that is self-created. We took it upon ourselves. We are public managers. We understand what the problems are with the city budget. But I stress to you, please take a look at what has occurred, what we say. We take pride. We're honored to be public managers especially in the, in the police department, as many of these people here. We have to work together. We are currently down three people, three law enforcement positions. I would ask that we look forward to getting this back to full staff. I would love to see next year to get a handful more employees. I know that's probably not feasible. There are efforts that need to be done on the city of Sheboygan streets. We have a street crimes unit that currently we want it to be members, uh, have four in members, four in number. We now currently have two members in that street crimes unit. They've been on the street almost 70 days. It began the, the 1st of uh, January. Uh, they've made a number of arrests. They made a, a buy at a low priority crack house. Uh, that led to a search of a house and a search of another house we obtained. Uh, crack cocaine and several pounds of marijuana. The drug problem is real. In two weeks, we're going to make a presentation uh, to this committee on the school resource officers. There have been some who said, Chief, you're short, just stop the school resource officer program. That's not the answer. I'm in support of that program. I think it serves a very valuable 
resource to this community. And please, uh, in two weeks, when we, we uh, present it to the Committee of the Whole, please listen and please come to an understanding. And then at that time, with some knowledge of the program, when it comes up for contract last time, then we can at least speak on terms where everyone is trained. I believe, Juan, you indicated, or, or Eric, you mentioned before, earlier tonight that we should learn, we should educate ourselves on some of these programs. And all I say is in two weeks, listen to the school resource officers, and we make this presentation, then with some knowledge, then make your decision as far as that contract. The challenge um, in this community is certainly to address public safety. I've been termed by some to be a crybaby. I speak on my shortages. I say we need more and more officers. We have worked, I, must, I sometimes think to a mistake. If I was to say I've agreed to be down three officers this year, I see it as a mistake. We try to work within the community, within the city, and to, to, to create and work and, and come up with solutions to this budget problem. I think the task in front of us here tonight is, of course, to address the increasing demands of policing, to address the violence, to address the drug concerns, and to deal with it within the budget and to prioritize. I have said this before, and Mary, you're probably sick and tired of me saying this, I think that public service, public safety, public protection within a police department needs to be a priority. I think what I would ask from the Common Council here tonight is to give the mayor some direction, give him some support uh, to get us back to full staff because our city is changing. We are doing what we can. I've asked our, our department to give approximately 120% of themselves. It's led to different problems, different issues, different stress, and I'm just asking we need we do need to get back to full strength. We've been under full strength for a number of years, and I ask, certainly we understand, and it's been our own creation. We have tried to work within this budget crisis, and we've kept ourselves short, but many of the things that I predicted have come true, and some of these things are here as uh, last week, shortly after the, the mega uh, drug bust, we then had another drug arrest, which was at a traffic stop, and we had psychedelic mushrooms and marijuana, I believe some cocaine also, so it's it's there. Please uh, okay, give us a man for a moment, please. Uh, Alderman Stefan. Uh, I just wanted to. I know Alderman Warner wanted me to mention it. it's actually three weeks, I think. Is it three yeah. weeks? But, I'm sorry. But the other issue was. Well, I mean, regardless, whatever it is, just. But my my other question was, we had a, a lengthy discussion in finance, and and we talked about. Your department putting, you know, I felt that we should get the officers rather than using this overtime. We weren't really saving any money. Would we be able to see that whenever you make a guys make a presentation? Are those numbers gonna? We can at least look at that and see how we really aren't saving any money by putting all this overtime out and not hiring officers. At least that was my you contention. Know, <clears throat> excuse me. That was probably one of the most difficult requests I've had. To, I've looked at at numbers on overtime and police overtime, individual numbers. We got papers this much, uh, this, this high, uh, thanks to Rich and his office. <clears throat> I agree a certain amount of overtime can be cut uh, by the addition of officers, yet by their mere existence, I think there will be some overtime that is associated with a new officer. Why? Because they're at holidays, they're at festivals. For example, the 4th of July, we will not allow any vacations. This, or I should scratch that. We will not allow any people off except those on vacation. So, which means you pick your vacation. After that, everyone will be working the 4th of July this year. Any officer on the street will make some arrests, and with that comes court time. So, there, within a certain degree, if, if we staff by overtime, that overtime cost will be cut back. Um, we handle over 45,000 complaints a year, 30,000 follow-ups a year. In 1977, when I first arrived in the Sheboygan Police Department, we had 93 officers. 1981, we then went to 97 officers. We currently have 91, currently staffed at 80, 88. We obtained statistics from the DA's office that from 1990, now this is not from the period when I first started, but from 1990, the, the number of criminal felony arrests went from 371 to 717. Same time period, 1990 to the present. Criminal misdemeanors, 1,249 to 1,804. 
criminal traffic arrests went from seven, 731 to 1223. That's about, in, in each respective category, increases of 194%, 144%, and then 167%. We handle, we handle a huge volume of complaints and arrests, yet if I was to compare the staffing of the current police department with the staffing when I first started, we are less we have less people on the road than we did at that time. What does that create? It creates a more efficient department, a department that needs to work together and consolidate efforts with the county. Yet at the present time, I'm not asking for more people than what's on my table of organization. And I thank you, Mayor, for addressing this concern, to take a look at it, to give us what we need, the resources we need. Yet at the same time, I know it's a tough year. It's a tough budget. Um, many of this and much of this is self-created, and we need to address some of the issues and concerns that we have. So. With that.